I'm head creative at Anition. Um, it's a company which creates brand experiences through emerging technologies. So at the moment, VR is big, but we've also we were started about 14 years ago, and we started primarily in uh, 3D filming, stereoscopic filming. So now that the VR has come around, all that experience we've got from uh, uh, VR, from uh, stereo filming, is really coming into play. Um, we also work with augmented reality widely with uh, 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 transparent screens, novel displays, holographic technologies. So VR, although it's something we focus on, on specifically at the moment due to the fact that it's getting quite big, <laughs> um, again, um, it's, it's not all we do. So um, I'm going to go and tell you a little bit about me. This is me looking forwards into the future of virtual reality. I'm, I'm head creative, so I'm not the captain of the ship, but I'm probably like the first mate of Edition's creative ship going forwards. Okay, so me, I have worked um, in a range of industries um, for the past 17 years. I started at QVC the Shopping Channel when I was 15 years old as an art worker. And from there, I started managing their photography studio. Went to uni to do motion graphics and animation. Um, and uh, from there, went to filmmaking. UK Film Council funded a couple of my films. Um, and then I ended up at Nishan. Like freelancing was dry for one year during the recession, so I thought I'll get a day job and do that and go back and start freelancing. But Nishan is exciting. Every project's different. So many different technologies, so many different clients, so many different projects. So it's interesting enough to, to kind of keep me there, basically. And now I'm not really going to talk about, um, I guess, development in terms of technical um, um, sides of VR, um, but you know, feel free to ask me any questions afterwards because although I am head creative, um, as I'm saying, I've been through a lot of different um, um, industries and I know quite a lot about technical side. Not how to do it, just know quite a lot about it. Okay, um, so um, I want to focus more on kind of conceptually what is VR, really? You know, you say VR to people and straight away they say, man, this is it's Oculus Rift and, you know, it's, it's become synonymous with virtual reality. Um, and it's the best device out there at the moment. Um, the best, the, the most widely available device other than mobile platforms. Um, but, you know, you say Oculus Rift and people, I mean, say virtual reality and people say Oculus Rift, you know, but let's go back. I'll take you back to the 60s, right? And this is the first kind of patent for any kind of virtual reality device, the Sensorama. Um, and it's 3D, it's wide vision, it's motion, it's color, it's stereo sound, aromas, wind and vibrations. That sounds like more than Oculus Rift. And this was conceived in like the 60s basically. Um, now, this isn't true virtual reality, but you can see that the ideas are there. You know, they're trying to immerse people in a kind of seamless experience, and that's kind of where we're, where we're heading now. Um, so, two years ago, we were using these. Um, everyone was obsessed with making smaller and smaller high-resolution LCD screens. Smaller, higher-resolution LCD screens, like the Sony HMD there. We used this for a couple of projects, like first um, uh, uh, virtual re re reality projects that I, that I led at Anishin. We used this a couple of years ago. The Sony HMD it was top of the line at the time. It was like a thousand pounds a goal. Um, so for brands, it was really a big leap. Um, being able, it, despite the development cost being much higher than the thousand pound price tag, it was a case of this is an unproven technology. Um, you know, um, we want to spend a thousand pounds on each of these headsets, basically. And it was a bit of a barrier of entry to brands. You know, you'd have to have a brand which either had a lot of money, but then the project could be quite boring. Uh, it could be an oil gas project or something along those lines. Or you'd have um, a really cool company that was forward looking and didn't have much money. So, you know, the experience would be a little lacklustre in certain aspects. Um, but now, obviously, we've got, due to mobile phone technologies, um, we've got the Oculus Rift, essentially, a gyroscope, a large screen. This was one of the key factors in, in, in virtual reality becoming more accessible to people, the technological side of it. But the other side was the idea side, because this is, you know, it's mobile phones, it's fine. But then this is the other piece of technology which made it available. Victorian, uh, 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 I, I can't remember what they call them, stereo viewers, basically. You have two images taken from slightly different sides um, and you've got your lenses and that made a big difference, really. It wasn't the fact of, oh my God, a new piece of technology has come out. Smartphone screens were out for ages, gyroscopes were out for ages. It wasn't about that. It was the fact that um, someone put two and two together. They said, let me take these mobile phone screens and look at this old technology Rather than making small screens to try and make a wider field of view, why don't you use big screens? 
and their lenses. It just makes so much more sense when you think about it that way. And everyone's thinking, if I thought about that, I could have had two billion pounds in the bank and sitting as some CEO of a, of a major company. But all he did was, was um, mix an old technology with a new technology, essentially. Um, and I guess that's what it's about, really. I mean, if, if you look at um, these, this combination of technologies, fine. But you start to remove the hardware and you get down to what is virtual reality, okay? So uh, play a game with me, if, if you will, for a little while. What is virtual reality? So this, Microsoft recently released their HoloLens, okay? So who says virtual reality? Okay, who says augmented reality? Okay, cool. All right, fair enough. I thought you were going to say virtual reality, yeah? So, you know, I mean, that's kind of spoiled my next part of my game, but <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Okay, but if you show this to people, if you look at things in the media, you know what I mean? You look at the HoloLens, you look at Google Glass, they explained in the media as virtual reality, although they are just augmented reality. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, yes, this is some of our augmented reality. I thought I'd slip some initial stuff in here as well. But yeah, we do quite, quite, quite high-end bespoke augmented reality. And that's essentially it. You take this, 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 this augmented reality, you put it on your face, and people begin to recognize it as virtual reality, even though it truly isn't. So you, you kind of begin to go along the idea that people are beginning to link virtual reality with a device rather than it being a concept or a platform. You know, really and truthfully, you couldn't turn around and say, this isn't virtual reality. You get, you're having virtual aspects and you're putting them into people's real space. You know, that to me is what virtual reality is about. It's about being able to augment people's uh, uh, reality, be able to add to their reality, to make them feel as though they're somewhere else, even if they're stuck in a particular room. And here's another one as well. This was a uh, Marshmallow Laser Feast's uh, advert for PlayStation. You know, how can you not call this virtual reality? They're literally creating a virtual reality in that space. Okay, and again, this was the first ever film screened in the cinema. Probably quite a lot of you are familiar with it, but it was a train coming down a platform. And this was up in early 1900s, maybe in the 1800s, I can't remember. But people jumped out of the way and were like, ah, when the train came down the platform. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's all really relative what people consider this virtual reality. To them, this was a virtual reality. You know, TV, film, games, anything which is getting really immersive, you know, is a virtual reality. And um, the Oculus Rift and, and such devices are really just a platform. The platform we're using at the moment, the most immersive and reactive platform we've got for putting people into that reality. Yes, it's all relative, as I just said. So um, here's a few projects we did. Um, uh, recently. I don't have any swanky videos, unfortunately. I didn't upload them. But um, this is one project we've done. I'm talking about three strands of virtual reality, which I think are really important. One is telepresence. So this is a project we did for Topshop for London Fashion Week last year. Um, and you have these five competition winners sitting in the window um, at the uh, Oxford Street store. And we had a dedicated optical line actually running down to the Tate Modern, where they had the fashion show. Um, and they could watch the show live as if they were there in the front row. Um, now, as was being said in the previous uh, presentation, uh, telepresence is going to be huge. It's not just the fact that you um, can put people in that space, but you can have one camera and 10,000 people watching something. You know, one thing we tried to do was to make the experience actually better than being there. So despite the fact that we had only a wide-angle camera, not a 360 camera, we had a wide-angle camera sitting in the front row, pulled it back a couple of feet so you could see people's phones next to you and stuff like that, made you feel as though you're more in the experience. And we also had tweets coming down as well. Um, we also had, uh, you look behind you and you could see backstage and you could see the models getting ready just before they step onto the catwalk, last makeup touches. Um, if you looked up, you went into another room and there were 360 photos being taken backstage and around the site which were updated live so people actually felt as though they were there. So. For me, this is part of it. You have telepresence, which is a huge thing. Again, as was being said in the last presentation, you, you, know, you, you can put them on the front row at Glastonbury. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can put them anywhere on the front row at a basketball game, take them to places which they may not other be, otherwise be able to experience. But at the same time, you can start to take advantage of other hardware and the device you're using. So we put in these Twitter feeds and these extra layers of, vi of video content and photo content, and with phones as well. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can log on, you can take advantage of what um, they're logging onto online and bring these into an experience to enhance the experience beyond the point of just kind of uh, uh, just transporting them. 
Um, the other, another one of the uh, main parts of virtual reality to me is to create an experience that people may never be able to do. So this was the first project that I, that I led. This was uh, a wingsuit simulator for Nissan. If anyone's kind of been to a Nissan in the past six months, you'll see that we've got our own one uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the studio now. So this was a crazy deadline. We did this in six weeks. Um, as you can see, this isn't Oculus Rift. This is actually the Sony HMD, which I was, I was showing you before. And we uh, took out the internals of that Sony HMD. We 3D, 3D, 3D scanning as well, forgot to mention that. But we 3D scanned um, some ski goggles, reverse engineered that, um, designed a custom casing for the HMD internals, rapid prototype that on our 3D printers, yes. <laughs> um, and then got them made up through another process. Um, alongside that as well, we designed this ergonomic carbon fiber bodyboard. Um, we had a, a motion platform base. We took the seat off and we mounted this on top of there. So as the people um, um, go through the experience, they are really being thrown around. And we also had a fan, a big fan in front of them, which was linked to the speed you were traveling during the experience. So, you know, to me, that was the one thing that really killed it. Um, uh, before that, yeah, it felt like a realistic experience, but once you had the fan in there, people really started screaming and jumping around. So it, it, was, it was really cool. And also just small bits as well, small bits of theatre, like these straps, they're not really necessary. Do you know what I mean? But you, know, you, you get people there, they turn up, they throw on a jumpsuit, they lie down, they, they put on the harness and they think, oh man, this is gonna be serious. And you know, and, and a part of that virtual reality as well was trying to convince people, not only convincing their eyes, to convince their brains they're doing something, but building up the experience around that as well. You know, the theater of all of that too. That is very important. People kind of just focus on what's happening within this virtual world rather than looking at everything surrounding that virtual world. Um, okay, I'll show you another one we did as well. Totally different but very similar as well. We, we like to try and engage as many senses as possible and as many senses as the client's budget will allow. So, um, thank you very much. <laughs> we did this one um, for um, uh, uh, Ogilvy Health, okay? So this was a hypoglycemic event simulator. It doesn't sound particularly interesting. Um, and I know so much more about diabetes now than I did before. But um, basically, you wake up in bed, you turn over, look at your phone, um, it says you're late for the meeting, where are you? And you uh, end up going downstairs, I'd send in a text, uh, I haven't had breakfast. Um, uh, this was all done automatically, you didn't have to actually do it, it was just the build up to, to the story. And you, you get in your car and you start driving and there's a radio show on and it talks about hypoglycemic events. And as you're driving along the street through this little city, um, the events start presenting themselves in the experience. So first of all you stop at a traffic light and your vision goes blurry. Um, and you kind of, it goes black for a second to show confusion, basically, and you, 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 you hear a car beeping behind you and the lights are green, you're like, oh, okay, you just drive off. But then we talk about lack of strength and we have a force feedback steering wheel and it becomes harder and harder to turn it when we're talking about lack of strength. We talk about confusion again, and when you turn your head left, we flip the camera, so it turned right. You know, it started messing with people's heads, tunnel vision, all of these effects we built into it, really to try and impress the fact on doctors of what it's, the, the sense of empathy of what it's like for their patients. And we had a heat seat in there as well, so that represented people getting hot flushes when they have the, uh, uh, hypoglycemic events. And in the end, you crashed, um, and um, it's dangerous to drive when you've got hypoglycemia um, going through, apparently. Okay, uh, this is another project we did. This is another thing which I like about virtual reality. It's being able to put people in something that wouldn't exist outside of your head, basically. That, to me, is a huge deal. Um, you know, you look at film, you look at games, you know, you, you can have a documentary, yes, you know, you can, you can base a film on reality or a real event, but what I find really exciting is the ability to create this universe that no one else would have ever seen before, an experience that no one else would have ever, ever been able to go to. So we created something for a designer called Gareth Pugh, again for, for, for Men's London Fashion Week actually, this was just a couple of weeks before, a couple of months before the um, Topshop piece. Um, and it was a journey into his mind and his creative process, essentially, and his influences. Um, and it was, uh, I should have put some images in here to actually show the VR experience instead of him just standing there. But um, 